All right, looks like we are just about live and ready to go here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to see so many of you piling in the room. All right, let's get this window open so I can see all your wonderful comments. There you go, click to expand. There we go. And as the comments come up, I start to see people popping in saying, good afternoon. Um, Philippe is my fan from Slovakia, Slovakia. And Victoria's in the house. Robert's in the house. Samuel's in the house. Welcome, everyone. Steve, uh, Bobby, I see you guys. I see Daryl uh, Hutton over on Twitter. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to have you guys here. So we're going to uh, jump right into today's topic, which is a crash course on InDesign. So this is, you know, for InDesign beginners, people that have always wanted to learn InDesign, people that may have been self-taught on InDesign, but feel they may have missed some things here and there. Uh, if you are an expert InDesign user, this is not for you. This is going to be very, very, very basic, very, very, very intro. Uh, so for those of you who have always wondered, what is InDesign? How do I use it? Why would I use it? When would I use it? How do I use it? That's what this is for. All right, so let's uh, start with the what is it, and then we'll jump into the how to use it. So you most likely have heard of Photoshop. Great. Photoshop image editor uh, that lets you do just about everything. Um, and it's pixel based, even though you can incorporate vectors inside of a Photoshop file, for the most part, the foundation is based on pixels. And do people do design in Photoshop? Absolutely. People design brochures and flyers and all kinds of things in Photoshop that in some cases probably would be better suited in another program, but oftentimes we use what we know. So if you've been learning Photoshop all this time, you know Photoshop, chances are it's going to be your go-to tool for things that you want to do. Um, Illustrator, same thing, but it's vector-based. So drawing with mathematical lines and curves, more of an illustration tool, more for creating those resolution independent vector graphics. And it's mainly, mainly for artists, although you can use it as a design tool. So you can design with it as well. And you can do those same kinds of things, brochures and and um, flyers and postcards and all kinds of pieces of art with Illustrator. So both Illustrator and Photoshop can design things for print and for online. But where InDesign comes in is it's a page layout tool. So it's designed for making long documents. It's designed for, for example, if someone said, hey, I wanted to design a book, chances are you're not gonna do that in Illustrator and Photoshop. You could, but chances are you'd be using the wrong tool. If someone said, hey, I wanted to design my, my, my magazine, yes, you could do it in Photoshop and Illustrator, but it would probably be not, you know, probably wouldn't be the best idea. So InDesign is for those situations where it's not just one page, it's not just a couple of pages, it's not just a few things. It's going to be a, a combination of pages with lots of content on it text, images, where you want total control of the layout. That's what InDesign's for. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the application itself. As I like to start these off whenever I can, empty, no document on, on the page, ready to go. And I've also done something I normally don't do. I've uh, set it to the Essentials Workspace. So the, oops, not indexing, Essentials. Yeah, the Essentials Workspace is the one that you start off with by default. Now, the reason I say I never use this is because it's essentials, it's bare bones. There's not a whole lot of stuff in the essentials workspace. You've got your properties panel and your pages panel, and that's it. I like to work with more stuff. So at some point before we're done, I'll probably switch over to a different workspace just because this one doesn't have all the things I, I would want. Uh, but it is enough to, for us to get started. So you have your panels on the right-hand side. I've kind of already talked about those, properties and pages. Now, the properties panel is fairly new. So I did, I did these videos a couple of times. I think the last one I did on how to get started with InDesign was probably when CC first came out. 
meaning we went from like CS6 to CC. So that was years ago. And there was no properties panel back then. And the properties panel kind of replaces the control panel that is normally at the top here for context sensitive stuff. So for example, when you're working with type, your type options would be here. When you're working with images, your image options would be here. When you're working with whatever content you've selected on the page, the controls for that content would be here. And then your pages panel is just as its name describes for working with your pages when you have a long multiple page document. Then you have all your tools over here on the left hand side. So I'm um, not going to spend time just calling out every single tool. It'd just be easier to go ahead and use InDesign and show you the tools as we go. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and create a new document. Now, um, this is also the difference. Whereas Photoshop, you're probably starting with a photo. Not everyone can paint or design from scratch uh, with just paint, putting pixels on the page. So with those, you're opening up a photo or you're using photos and you're manipulating them. With InDesign and Illustrator, you're typically starting with a blank document or a template, and then you're putting things into it. Now, I'll talk about templates in just a minute, but let's go ahead and say new document. And when I bring up the new document, this is uh, also fairly new in the last few years. This, doc, this new document start screen was not the way it always was. It used to just be your measurements. You didn't have all this stuff on in the left-hand side. Now you do, which is great. And also uh, you notice that it starts you off with these tabs across the top so that you can pick the best format for what it is you're about to lay out. So if you're about to lay out a print piece, you can click on print and it gives you default print sizes to work with. Uh, you can, of course, view all the presets. Uh, if you're working on web, something online, whether it's an online interactive document or an online PDF, um, you get the online sizes. So these are more screen-based, the size and resolution of a screen or display. And then mobile would be for like books, eBooks. Um, things that are going to be looked at on a mobile device. So when you think about an ebook, you typically are reading it on a tablet or a phone. Even though you can do it on a computer, those are the devices you typically look at an ebook on. So that's why these are these categories are here. Um, and Anissa loves the organization of the new document screen. Yes, it does help out a lot, especially for the beginners. All right. So uh, Steve saying I've been using InDesign for a long time. But I still love these basic tutorials because chances are there are a couple of trick, tips and tricks that I didn't know. And I agree. I always learn even when I watch people do the thing that I know how to do because sometimes they show something in a way I would have never thought to do it. All right. So let's go back to print. Let's say we're going to work on a print document and we could go in and just you don't have to use any of the stuff on the left side. You can go in and specify exactly what you want. You know, you want an eight and a half by 11, 20 pages, you know, with whatever margin, so forth and so on. You can just go to town specifying whatever you want. But if you don't know what you want, you can, of course, click on one of the presets. Now, I said I would mention templates. If you find yourself design challenged, meaning the blank page kind of frightens you, then um, you will be happy to know that InDesign does come with the ability to download templates at no additional cost. So the ones with the blue check mark are ones that I've downloaded in the past and I can use over and over and over again. The ones that don't have a check mark are the ones I haven't used yet. So these are all being proposed as possible print templates because that's the category we're in. And here's a, uh, a stylish business card set. Here's a you know, business or what does it say? Um, business card layout. And you'll find brochures and guides and all kinds of things. So if you say, hey, I don't feel like doing it from scratch, even if you are a professional, you can at least get started with a lot of the layout. And then, of course, put your own content in and change it up any way you want. So um, even, even though I know InDesign pretty well, been using it for over 20 years, um, I still like to start with a template from time to time just because it will speed things up. I don't have to do everything from scratch. Um, and the templates, if they use fonts you don't have, these the fonts in all of these templates use Adobe fonts that are part of your subscription to Creative Cloud. So it'll say, hey, you're missing these four fonts. Do you want to sync them? And then you can just say yes and go ahead and sync them. And then it will use, uh, you'll be able to use those fonts in the template. All right. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, Angela, uh, Amory Concepcion is sharing a PDF out there. Great. Um, glad you guys are also watching. Okay, so I'm going to do it from scratch. I, I will come back to, I'll show you how a template works at the very end, but I'm just going to do it from scratch because a lot of people will be doing things from scratch. Uh, so let's say that I want to create just a simple four page document. So uh, eight and a half by 11, you make it tall or wide. And yes, way back in the day, you had to pick one or the other and stick with it. Now InDesign can support different sizes of the pages and different orientations within the document. You're still going to pick one to start with, but you can add more pages or change the pages as you go. Let's say you want four pages, but you want the third page to be wide for some reason. You could do that. So you don't know you no longer have to have all the pages be the same size and all the pages be the same orientation. And that uh, got changed years ago. All right, so anyway, I'm gonna say that, uh, again, I want um, number of pages four. All right, then it's gonna ask me uh, facing pages. And uh, I usually have an example here I can show you somewhere. I have a magazine, yeah, I have a magazine here. So for example, what's a facing page document? A facing page document is a document where when you open it up, not a fold out. When you open it up, let's do one that's not the postcard. There we go. You'll have pages that face each other. So they're facing pages. So there's a left page and a right page. If you um, are working with single page, a single page document, or I'm sorry, um, sing, or yeah, single pages that don't face each other, then you would uncheck the box. So what does that box really do? All that box sets you up for is literally for having a left and right page. Um, and the reason you would do that, if you're making a thicker publication, like this magazine is not that thick, but if you were making a thicker publication, you might want more space on the inside margins to so your text doesn't go into the fold. And that way you can um, specify the left margin will be I'm sorry, the inside margin will be whatever, and the outside margin may be a little smaller. So the inside margin on the left page will be on the right side, the inside margin on the right page will be on the left side. So that's all that checkbox really sets you up for. All right, let's put the magazine away. That was an old issue of Star Trek magazine that I just keep in the drawer. All right, anyway, um, I'm gonna say that yes, we do want facing pages for this one. And uh, start page number. Because your document, if you're working on like a long book, like let's say hundreds of pages, you might want to separate it into multiple documents. So the first document could be pages one through 100. The second document could be pages 101 through 200. So this one could start with page one. The next one could start with page 101, so forth and so on. So we're going to keep it starting page one. Primary text frame. I'm going to leave that unchecked for now. I'll explain that a little bit later because you don't know what a text frame is if you're new. Uh, so we're going to leave that unchecked. And then number of columns. I'm not going to change any of this right now. The only thing I will do just for visual reference is I will change the inside margin. All right, let's change the inside margin just to make it three quarters of an inch so that you can see, see it visually when we go into the document. Now, bleed and slug. Typically, um, unless you're doing, well, let's, let's show you what it is. Unless you're printing to the edge of your publication, you don't really need to do this. But uh, for example, you notice the cover of this old Star Trek magazine, uh, the text, or I'm sorry, the color of the background goes all the way to the edge, all the way to the edges of the paper. Well, when this is printed, which it would be printed like that, when this is printed, um, it's printed on a larger sheet of paper that is then cut down to the edge of the color. Now, in order to do that, to make that work, you have to make your document or your design your document a little bit bigger than the actual page. So then when it's cut down, it's cut to the edge of the colors or the edge of the content. So in order to do that, that's called a bleed. You would add a bleed around your page so that you can design off the edge of the page. So when it's cut, it's cut right to the edge. We're not gonna do that today, but that's what bleed is. Slug is used mainly in, um, I would say advertising agencies 
use slugs the most. It's not exclusive to them, but they use it the most. And what this is is for documents that get passed around. Maybe it's a printed piece and people are passing it around and looking at it. The slug is like a piece of information at the bottom, top, left, right, wherever it is on the page that tells them about it, who the author is, who the uh, who who came up with all the graphics, who's the lead designer, who's the art director, so forth and so on. So again, it just gives you that extra space around your document that typically would not be a part of the document so that you could design that information on it. So that's why this is twirled up by default because most people aren't doing a bleed in the slug. But if you are, they're there for you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click Create. And that will give me my four page document. And you're probably saying, well, Terry, I only see one page. Where are the other three? The other three are down below. So if you scroll, uh, let's scroll over a little bit, you'll see that you have page one at the very top and then pages two and three facing each other and then page four. And you'll notice that page one is a right page and page four is a left page because typically you would take a book and uh, take a book and you would open it. So the right page would be page one or the cover or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then therefore you would be able to um, put the rest of the content in. Now, if you decide it after the fact, oh, I don't want four pages, I want eight. I don't need eight, I need 12. I need whatever it is. You can always add or delete pages in the pages panel. So don't be, a, don't be um, scared of that first thing that asks you how many pages when you say, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know yet how many pages I'm gonna need because you can always change it after the fact. So that is not something you are locked into by any means. All right, uh, let me see here. I see some new comments. Just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, cool, cool, cool. Dun, 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 dun. All right, and Bobby says, I never knew what a slug was. So that's what a slug is when you're creating that new document. Okay, so now we have our, our pages. And of course, um, the thing that's nice about InDesign and, and to, to the credit of Photoshop and Illustrator with artboards today, you now get similar capabilities where you have as many pages as you asked for, and then you can start designing anywhere you want. Hey, you want to design page four first? Design page four first. You, you're not locked in like a word processor where you have to type in order. So the page layout is the page layout that you create anywhere you want along the way. Now, the next most important thing, so that was how to get started with a new document. Thing number two is things that you want on all the pages or most of the pages. Instead of me putting a logo on every single page or a bar across the bottom, a rule across the bottom on every single page, there's something in InDesign called the master page. And the master page, you can have more than one, but the master page is used to put things on, to replicate things across multiple pages. So people will put design elements across multiple pages. People will put um, uh, page numbering in one spot on the master page. So it replicates across uh, all the documents. So instead of you typing one, two, three, there's a way to do auto page numbering. Then all of that stuff that you want on every single page or most of the pages, you would put on the master page. So if you look at your pages panel, we zoom into it, you'll notice that there's an A master that's facing left and right. And then there's all the pages. And you notice that all the pages have an A on them because by default, they're using the A master. So if I create a new master, it would be the B master. And by default, none of the pages would be using that. So that's what I meant by you can have multiple, pa multiple master pages and assign those master pages to whichever pages you want by dragging and dropping them on those pages. Okay, so next, let's say that I wanna to go to the uh, A master page, the left and right here, and I want to just put something on all the pages in the upper left and right hand corner. So what the way I would do that, and now we're gonna get into how do you place content in InDesign. Uh, InDesign, as much as it can do, and as many things as you can have, and as many things as you can put on a page, it really boils down to, for most people, three things. If you learn these three things, then there's nothing you can't do in InDesign. 
because every, everything else is just learning how to tweak those three things. So you ready? Here are the three things. I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm just kidding. The three things are text, images, and rules. Now, there are more than that, but those are the basic three things. Now, you might say, well, Terry, what about tables? Well, that's really a form of text and graphics organized in, in, in columns and, and rows. So it's, it's, it's still those three things. And technically, tables go inside of a text frame. So those are the three things you really need to know. If you know those three, the rest is easy. All right, so for example, I want to put in an image, a small image in the upper left-hand corner of this page. Now, I can do this one of two ways. I can either just go get my image and bring it in, or I can put a placeholder there for it first and then bring it in. So I'm going to zoom into this area. I just grabbed my zoom tool and zoomed in, letter Z. And I'm going to go ahead and put the placeholder in first. So you have these uh, frames. InDesign puts images and text inside of frames all the time, meaning 100% of the time, whether you put it in there or not yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a uh, frame. I'm just going to go ahead and drag it out to be the upper left-hand corner here. So there's my frame. Now that frame is empty. Nothing will print there. Nothing's there yet. Nothing exists inside that frame. I'm saying I'm basically reserving that little space for something. Now, the frames themselves can be any shape. You get default tools of rectangle, elliptical, and polygonal frames, but you can literally design a frame any shape you want with a pen tool or with Illustrator or converting text into a frame. So frames don't have to be any specific shape, but they do exist. They have to exist. All right, so now that I've got that frame there, how do I put something in it? You probably have already guessed because it's 2020, how do you put something in anything? You can drag and drop it. So if you can get to it, even if it's on your desktop, if it's in your folder somewhere and drag it into that frame, it will place it inside the frame. Or you can say, no, 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 I don't wanna to have to manage window, two windows and, and moving stuff around and, and doing it that way. Then you can do it from the file menu. You can say file and place. That will bring up your file system and you can go grab whatever content you want to place inside that frame. Um, the other way and the newer way I would say would be to use Creative Cloud libraries because libraries work across all the Creative Cloud applications. Uh, and therefore you can bring stuff in that's in a library and you can use it over and over and over again. So for example, this is what I meant by I'm already outgrowing this space, this, uh, this workspace because the Essentials Workspace doesn't have libraries on it, but that's okay. Go to my window menu, I come down to CC Libraries, and that will open up the CC Library panel. Or maybe it was there. Oh, I lied. Okay, maybe it was there, I can't remember. Okay, but anyway, here's my CC Library panel. I'm gonna to go to my brand new 2020 library that I just created today. And here's some stuff that I already put in there. And you can put stuff in your library from any application. So I can, and I can even drag and drop things from the operating system into the library, uh, which is a fairly new feature. All right, so let's say that I want to put this uh, fitness fist inside that frame. So I'm going to just go ahead and drag it over. And it's going to say, okay, you, you pulled it into InDesign now. Where do you want it? And as soon as I hover over the frame, I can click and it will go inside that frame. And you're saying, Terry, all I see is orange. What happened to the, the rest of the fist? Well, when you place things in InDesign by default, they come in at 100%. And if you've not done anything to the frame, then the frame is just gonna show you as much of that 100% as it can. So therefore, that image is too big for the frame. Now, if you're thinking the frame is too small for the image, I'm gonna ask you to think about it differently. <laughs> <laughs> because there is two ways to think about it, right? Frame's too small, image is too big. The reason we say the image is too big is because hopefully you made the frame the size you wanted it to be. If you're saying the image is too, or the frame's too small, then that means you really weren't, weren't designing the frame the size you wanted it to be, right? All right, so anyway, uh, the image is too big for the frame. So how do we handle that? Well, if we, remember we talked about that properties panel? Well, now the properties panel has stuff in it because that frame is selected. And so now I could go in and I could have all these frame fitting options right here, all these little um, buttons. So I can say, well, fit the content proportionally. That means scale the content down 
to fit the frame, even if it leaves white space in the frame. And for a photograph, that makes a difference. For a logo, probably doesn't make a huge difference, uh, especially if your frame is somewhat close to the uh, proportions of the image. Next, fill the frame, uh, fill the content proportionally. This is the one I probably use the most because what I'm usually saying is I want to be able to see um, wait, am I doing the wrong one? I'm doing them in the wrong order. Sorry, I did them in the wrong order. The first one, because it used to be the other way around. The first one is fill the frame proportionally. That means fill the frame, don't leave any white space, even if you cut some of the image off. And for a photograph, that's okay, because there's usually parts of the photograph you can cut off with no problem. For a logo though, that doesn't work well, because there's part of the logo we're not seeing. So the next one is fit the content proportionally. And that's the one that says, no matter what, even if I got to leave white space, I'm going to fit the logo down into that frame so the whole logo shows. So for a photograph, fill frame proportionally, my favorite option. For something that I need to be able to see all of it, fit the content proportionally so I can see all of it. And then everything else is just different variations of fitting. And then there's a brand new one called Content Aware Fit, which is mostly for photographs. We'll talk about that later. All right, so now let's go ahead and zoom out. And so we added that to the upper left of the upper of the left master page. Now I want to put it over on the right hand side. Do I have to do that all over again? No, because we can copy paste, we can duplicate, we can drag and drop it and have it duplicate. If you hold down the modifier key, there's all kinds of ways to do the same thing. Just like in Photoshop, there's all kinds of ways. So uh, if I want to duplicate that over here, I can just, I'm using the um, selection tool because I want to select this as an object. And if I hold down my option key and don't drag directly in the middle, see, I don't want the hand. I want anywhere else around that little circle in the middle. And then I hold down my Option or Alt key. When I drag it, I am now making a duplicate. So I can let go of the key now because I've already made my duplicate. And now I can zoom out and I can take my duplicate and move it all the way over here where it goes. Right there. Okay. So now we just put something in the upper left corner of the master page, something in the upper right corner of the right master page. And we go back to our pages and we look at all of our pages. Page one has it, page two has it, page three has it, page four has it, page 400 has it, page 4,000 has it. All the pages would have it because all the pages are using that A master. So what if I don't want it on the first page? The typical question I would normally get at this point. Then you could do one of two things. The easiest thing is if you don't want any of the master items on the first page, then instead of having the first page use A, have it use none. So page A is no, I'm, I'm sorry, page one is no longer using the A master. Two, three, and four are, but one is no, not using the master at all. So whatever I put on the master from here on out will never be on page one. The other way, I'm gonna undo that. The other way is if you want to get rid of a specific thing from the master, this is more of an advanced tip for my people that have been watching this uh, before and you're like, well, I kind of knew all this. Well, here's an advanced tip you might not have known. You can unlock individual things from the master. So if I hold down on Mac, Command Shift, PC, Control Shift, I can click that item on page one, because remember I'm on page one, and delete it. And I'm still using the A master on page one, so everything else from that master page would still be there, but the logo is now gone. The logo is still on the master page, it's still on page three, still on page two, still on page four. It's just no longer on page one because I was able to unlock it from the master and delete it. Now, what does that mean, unlock it? Why is it locked? Because when you put things on the master page and you go to your regular document pages, you can't click on those things. You can't do anything with them. I can't move this. I can't click on it. I can't scale it. I can't size it. I can't do anything because it's on the master. If I want to change it, I go to the master page and change it. So that prevents you from accidentally making design changes to things that you want to remain consistent. All right, we are so running low on time already. So let's get to the other two things and then we'll do some variety. All right, so um, let's go back to page one. On page one, I'm gonna go back to my uh, libraries here. 
and I'm just going to bring in a photograph. Now, the last time I created a frame, brought the, the logo in, put it in a frame, scaled it, sized it. You don't have to do it that way either. If you want to just place your content, you can go file, place, go find whatever it is on your hard drive you want to place. And by the way, InDesign has always been very generous of the file formats it supports. It supports JPEG, TIFF, um, PDF, Illustrator files, EPS, Photoshop files, ping, just about every graphic format you could imagine you can place inside of InDesign. With the exception for my photographers, you cannot place raw files. But just about everything else can be placed. Uh, so if you want to just go get something you already have, just place it. Or in my case, I'm just going to pull over a photo from the library. I'm going to pull, out, pull over one of these workout photos. Let's drag this one in. Now you notice I don't have a frame. I don't have anything to click it into yet. So what I can do is say I can design my frame on the go. Now I'm not holding down any keys, but it will automatically proportionally scale the first time because it knows the proportions of that photo. So all I'm doing is making the photo bigger or smaller without holding down any keys. And it's deciding here, we'll place it, and we get a smart guy letting me know that's the middle. And when I let go, it's perfectly placed it, there's nothing missing, and it's made a frame to fit that exact size. Now, uh, quickly, how do frames work for graphics? Well, you notice that this is already here, it's already in a frame. Um, the frame has corners, and you might say, oh, I meant to make it a little smaller, a little bigger. And then you go to grab a corner, and you do that, and you know, oh, wait, hold on, stop, that's not what I wanted. You made the frame smaller, not the content and the frame. The content is inside that frame. It stayed 100%. All you did was make the frame bigger or smaller. Uh, so if I make it bigger, I made the frame bigger. The content still stayed the same. So in this case, the frame is using is, is basically being used like a crop tool. I can say, oh, I don't, don't want to really see, uh, maybe I don't want to see her as much as I want to see him, so I can crop her off. She's still there, but we're not seeing, maybe she didn't sign a model release, so we're not seeing her face. Um, I'm making this up as I go along. So let's undo. So cropping is one way, but if you want to scale and um, drag at the same time, then you're going to hold down two keys. And hold down the Command key on Mac, Control key on, on uh, PC, Shift key to make it proportional. And then when you drag it, you're now scaling at the same time. So you're scaling the frame and the content. That way you're getting both scaled at, the, at once. Otherwise, you're just always, if you don't hold down anything, you're always changing the frame. And sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes you want to, to hide portions of the photo. Uh, maybe I don't want all that equipment on the left-hand side, so I want to bring it over a little bit just so I get just the two people working out, not the equipment. So depends on what you want. So that's how um, you move content. Uh, that's how you scale content inside of a frame. Now let's do one more. Let's zoom out. Let's grab another photo. And let's do the same thing. Place it right here. And we'll uh, go out to the center again. And we'll place that one. Now what if I zoom in? And what if I... Oh, didn't mean to scroll down. Touchy mouse. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. I promise you I'm not drunk scrolling. Okay, but anyway, let's say that I want to make this frame smaller. Great, pull it in. But I also want to move her to the right of the frame. So I made the content, I made the frame smaller, so there's more content we're not seeing. But that's what that little circle is for in the middle. That's called the grabber, um, content grabber, I believe is the official name. I can hold it down for a couple seconds, see my content and move it over in the frame. And therefore now I'm adjusting the content without moving the frame. If you click on it with the selection tool anywhere outside of that circle, you're moving the frame. If you click on or about the circle, you're moving the content in the frame. So that's the way images work inside of frames inside of InDesign. All right, ne next. And uh, so that's content piece number one, images. Content piece number two, text. So how do you work with text? The same, basically almost the same way. Uh, if I want to place some text, I can either just type right in InDesign 
or if my image or if my text has already been typed, I can place it inside of InDesign. So InDesign uh, can place text from various word processing formats like text and word. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So if, you, if you're a Mac user and using pages, you have to export out as a Word document or a text document. So RTF text, standard ASCII text, and Word documents are natively supported. Uh, or if you just say, hey, I, I don't have the text already typed. I want to type it while I'm in InDesign. You can do that as well. Uh, but you'll notice that when you click the type tool, a beginner, a, a rookie mistake would be you click the type tool and you just click and you start typing and nothing happens. All your tools start changing because you're hitting keyboard shortcuts because just clicking doesn't do anything. Remember what I said at the very beginning, all content has to be inside of a frame except rules. Uh, so same thing with text. It has to be in a frame first before you can actually use the type tool and start typing. That's why the type tool is in the shape of a box because it's saying, hey, make a frame first, then you can type. Uh, so if I wanna make a frame, let's say I wanna put a frame right here uh, across the page. Now I get a cursor, now I can start typing. So I can start typing the word workout. And once I get my, and I can keep typing, you get the idea. And when I get to the end of the line, it would wrap around. So. Type 101, typing the way you've been typing since since the beginning of computer time. Now, I got the word workout in there. I want the word workout to be different, bigger, di maybe a different font, different um, different orientation, so forth and so or justification, so forth and so on. Well, all of that, again, is in the properties panel. Look at how the properties panel is now changed for text. So properties panel on an image gives me image stuff. Properties panel on text gives me text stuff. So I get whatever in context in this properties panel for whatever it is I have I'm working on on the page. So if I highlight the word workout, just like you would any other program, and I want to change the word workout, I can come over here now and change it any way I want. I can change the size. Let's say I want to make it 48 point instead. I can change the font to whatever. Uh, we'll just use the very next font down. Great. I can change the color. The color is right here and make it a different color. I can change it to be whatever I want it to be while I have the word selected. So, and you can select each word or each letter or whatever you want and change it any way you want. Now, if I want to do it more visually, which is my way of doing it, um, me picking point sizes never works because unless someone specs out a document and says, this needs to be 48 points, I'm never guessing the right size until I see it. So my favorite since day one keyboard shortcut for text is Command, PC Control, Shift, and then the greater than symbol on a US keyboard, which is right above the period. So greater than makes it bigger. I'm just hitting the greater than while I'm holding down the other two keys. Less than, which is the comma, makes it smaller. So that way I can make it big enough. Ooh, what happened? Why did it go away? You notice that there's a red plus sign now at the bottom of that frame. That's letting me know I'm in what's called an overset situation. So there's more text than frame, <laughs> meaning it's too big. So it's still selected. If I just go down, oh, I went down to where it still fits. So you make it big enough till it till you can't see it, meaning, oh, it's too big, or till you see it the size you want and then go back down to make it fit again. And we'll talk about overset and how to deal with that with regular text in just a minute. Okay, so there's my workout. And again, if I select it with a selection tool, I can move it around, I can put it wherever I want, I can put it on a different page if I want because we have all these other pages. I can do whatever I want with this as an object. If I double click on it and I'm back into the text tool, if I triple click, I'm selecting the text. I can get back to it and work on it any way I want. I can change the color, change the size, whatever I want to do. Let's put it back where it goes. All right, so now we got that back where it goes. Um, the next thing I want to do now, since we're still working with text, is I want to now place text. In other words, watching me type is boring. You don't want to watch me type paragraphs of text, trust me. So let's get some text that we want to place. So I'm going to go ahead and choose File Place. And this will be text that's been typed in a word processor or scanned or copied into a text file, however you got it there. Um, Creative Cloud demo files, InDesign. If we do this by name, it'd be easier. 
There we go, Adobe InDesign. And um, I know I have a couple text documents here. Here's one an article I wrote called Shoot Outside the Comfort Zone, the Gettysburg Address, the I Have a Dream speech. There we go, from yesterday's MLK Day. Let's use that. So replace, um, do I have something? Ooh, hang on, cancel. I was about to make a mistake, maybe? No, it wasn't. Okay, I thought I had something selected because it was asking me to, to, to replace what I had selected. All right, let's go back to that. CC demo files, InDesign, and the I Have a Dream speech. Okay. So this is just the text from Martin Luther King's speech, and it's telling me there's a font I don't have, which is okay, I'm gonna keep going. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, where I want this text to be. So once again, if I drew the frames first, I can click inside the frame. Since I did not draw the frame first, it's asking me to make a frame to put this text in. So I can say, oh, you know what? I want this text to go right here next to this, um, this image. And the text comes in, and by the way, let's go ahead and just make this a font that we have so we don't have to deal with this. I don't know, Proxima Nova, really? Myriad Pro. Sorry, it's just I was using a font that I didn't have in that text document. Okay, so now here's a font, uh, or here's a text, and same thing, I got the red plus sign letting me know, hey, there's more speech than you have um, in frame for. So what are your choices? There are three. Make the text smaller. Okay, not going to work in this case because there's just too much text to make it smaller. Like make it 10 point, 9 point, 8 point. Yeah, that ain't going to work. It's too much text. Option number two. Delete some of the text. And if you're the author, maybe you have that leeway to say, ooh, I was too wordy. Let me reword it. Re delete some of the text so it fits. Oh, yeah, I wrote too much. But if you're working on a document for someone and this speech has to be here in its entirety, then you don't have the option to delete text. You don't have the option to reword it. So option number three is continue it somewhere else. Remember, it's a four page document. You got more room. So where do you want to continue it? So um, that's where you go back to the selection tool and you say, oh, yeah, this won't fit. I'm going to click that plus sign. And I get my place gun again, and then I can say, uh, put some more here, put some more on page two, put some more on page three. I can put it, let's say we do it all on page two. There we go. Ooh, there's more yet. Click the plus sign again. And put the, the rest on page three. See if that fits. Oh no, there's more. Long speech. And let's put the rest on page four. And that's it. Okay, so that's all of the text. No more plus signs. And it starts on page one and continues on page two, three, and four. All right, now what? We can still play. So for example, here's some of the things you need to know about text frames. This text frame is now linked. There's no more red plus sign. It's now linked to the one on page two, but you wouldn't know that just, you know it's linked somewhere, you wouldn't know where. So one of my favorite viewing options under view is to um, go to extras and turn on text threads. So when I show text threads, when the frame's selected, it will show me where it goes. Oh, it goes all the way over here. Oh, it goes from there to there. Oh, it goes from there to there. And when the frame is not selected, you don't see that stuff. So it's only when you click on the frame that you see those lines. And of course, those lines don't print or export out. Um, okay, so now I know where it continues. So here's here's all your test questions, your quiz. If I make this frame longer, what happens when I let go? I'll wait for the answer. Okay, kidding. Uh, I know you can't answer unless you just type it in the comments, but by the time you type it in, I will have answered it. It will suck the text over from page two because there's more room. So it just brings over some of that text from page two and reflows the rest of the document. So now there's less text on page four. All right, if I make the frame smaller, let's say I go to this frame and I wanna leave room for an image and I make the whole left side of that or right side of that smaller, then it will force that text over to the next page. And 
it still didn't fill it up so I can I have some more room to play maybe on, on this page maybe I want to leave room at the top of this page for a photo so I can bring this one down so you can just keep playing with the frames and it will keep shifting the content around uh, as needed now what if you decide to change your layout like this let's say you want this here you want this one to stop here you want to pull this one back out you've decided to not go with the short frame anymore you want to fit that one um, so that all the content fits inside there and great now you have this space at the bottom maybe you want to put some more text from this speech along the bottom but it's too late you've already continued that text on page two well you can always change your mind with the linking you can say oh you know what I don't want that to continue on page two yet click you get the replacement gun again and you can then say oh yeah put some of that text down here and watch what happens when I let go it just repairs all the linking so it says oh you want to add a frame in the middle no problem I'll still relink and continue on page two page three page four so um, and same thing if you delete a frame it will repair the links and connect the two, the frame before and the frame after to continue the text. All right, so um, that's just a quick little thing to get your head around how, <laughs> so Linda says it fills up with text, uh, to get your head around how linking works. So item number one, images. Item number two, text. What's item number three? Item number three is pretty easy. It's working with rules. So you have this line tool, and the line tool allows you to create rules. So there's a straight line across the top, diagonally, horizontally, vertically, however you want. By default, that line has zero weight, so zero points. It will not print. It will not show until you give it some thickness. So I'm going to give it two points of thickness. You change the color, change the stroke, change the, um, the look of it. You can have uh, like a two double line thin thing, and we'll make it nice and big. So you see it. So you can change the style of it, change it any way you want change the color, change whatever you want about it. All right, so those are the three elements. From here on out, I'm out of time, but what I want you to do is go practice with those three elements. Images, text, and now we know that text can be linked. It can be linked to different pages. It can, text, the links can be broken and added new frames in. You can delete frames and it'll continue, and you can just go on and on about, um, working with your document designing. Oh, now I left room up here. And let's say now I want to put another image in. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a frame first because I want the, the image to be an exact size that may not be the proportions of the image. And now when I bring an image in, it's 100% like we said, but if I click my favorite option, fill frame proportionally, it will fill the frame even though the image is not that size. So there's some of it cut off on the top and bottom. How would I know? Go to your content grabber, count, hold down and count to two. And it'll show you what got cut off. So part of his head cut, got cut off in the ceiling and her feet got cut off because the image is too short. Or the frame, I should say, is too short. So I can say, I don't care about their feet. I do care about his head. I can move the image down inside that frame. Um, you have all kinds of transparency options. You can ghost the frame on top of text. You can ghost the frame behind the text. You have um, layering options. You can work with your layers panel and put things on layers and lock layers and all those kinds of things. So again, this is just massaging those three things. Now that you've learned what those three things are, it's a matter of putting those three things together all the time, every time you put together an InDesign document. And no, every document doesn't have to have rules in it, any lines mean. But you uh, definitely will have text and images usually. So at this point, add more pages, delete pages, change the page orientation, change the sizes. Um, add more images, add less images, more text, less text, format the text, add style so you can quickly format the text as you go. One quick one, since uh, we'll just wrap with this one, and I said the word wrap for a reason, we're going to do text wrap. Let's place one more thing. Let's place this logo. And what you might say is, ooh, that logo looks cool, but I want the text to be around it, not underneath it. And I don't want the whole frame to be on the left-hand side. So there is something called text wrap. 
and text wrap is right here on the properties panel. So uh, if we zoom into that, you have uh, no wrap. You have the wrap around the bounding box, so just wrap around the shape of the frame. You have this one, which is one you probably want, wrap around the object. All right, so here's what happens though. Let's try this one. Oh, that's what I expected. It wraps around the frame. Oh, well then this one is obviously going to wrap around the shape. And you click it and nothing happens, nothing changes. It did not wrap around the shape of the fitness. Why? Because 25 years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, uh, is it 20 or 25? I can't remember. 20 years ago, within, it's 20. 20 years ago within design, the InDesign engineer that wrote this feature made you do one more thing. And that is, I don't know if it's even in the properties panel. It is not. So I'm going to have to go to my text wrap panel where I have all my text wrap options. And in my text wrap options, in the text wrap panel, there's one more thing I have to do. And that is uh, either detect edges or if you have an alpha channel, use the alpha channel. So if I say detect edges, then it says, okay, now I know how to wrap around the shape. And you can say, ooh, that's coming in too tight. I don't want text wrapped around that way. You can uh, increase the spacing around it so that the text goes around the shape uh, or further away from it. So even if I now grab this and move it, Hang on, wrong thing I have selected there, sorry. There we go. And move it, there we go. The text will wrap around the shape of it. All right, that was um, just a little bit of InDesign. Crash course, getting started. Go forth, multiply your InDesign documents. You have everything you need to know to create stuff. From here on out, you should just be asking questions about formatting. How would I do this? How would I do that? But you've got the basics to get InDesign now. At this point, you're saving, you're printing, you're exporting PDFs, you're massaging it, you're changing colors, you're changing the type, you're spell checking, you're doing all that stuff, but it's just working with those same three things. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, he's asking, am I, am I uh, waiting to get back to the advanced view, which actually, you know, the view, the uh, workspace, that, besides my own personal workspace, the workspace I work in most of the time is the digital publishing workspace. But I, uh, I've i made my own called the Terry White workspace, and that just has all the stuff in it that I need, including the control panel at the top. So yeah, you don't have to stick with the Essentials workspace once you once you want more, more things to do. All right, uh, so with that said, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, it was a blast showing you InDesign from the ground up. I know it was quick, even though it seemed like it was almost an hour, which it was, but there's just so many things that I could go into now because now it's just tweaking. And that's what the rest of the streams are all about, is tweaking those three things. So we learn more and more and more as we go about InDesign, but I wanted to start the year off giving you some basics to get back to. And uh, for those of you who are new with InDesign, this should give you enough till next time. All right, so with that said, cheers, everybody. Uh, let's see if I make sure I didn't miss any questions. All right, uh, I just see lots of, this is right on time. Great, Terry, I needed this. That when they ask questions, then I missed them. So let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I have no idea how I share this. Okay. Uh, all right, I don't see any burning questions, but as always, uh, you can always reach out to me on social media if I missed your question. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm watching three streams at once, so I don't always see them. All right, so with that said, cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye, everybody.